Well, we're going to finish up Nehemiah today. We're going to look at Nehemiah 11, 12, and 13. It's a lot of lists, a lot of names. It's a title, a sermon entitled uh, Volunteers, Villains, and Vindication. Volunteers, Villains, and Vindication. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Nehemiah chapter... Oh, actually, you know what? We're going to stand. We're going to read from God's Word. But just follow along today because I'm, I'm reading from all three chapters uh, 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 today. So uh, it'll be hard for you just to flip along. But if you follow along on the screen today, you, we'll get the gist of where we're going today. Actually, we're reading from 11 and verse and chapter, chapter 11 and chapter 13. But it says this. God's Word says to us this today. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem... And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of God of Israel with bread or, and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Thus I cleansed from them everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appropriate times, and, at the first fruits, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that again, Lord, it is full of life. Your words are life. Your words are food, true food. Your word is true drink, just as your blood is, Father God. And Father, we ask that you would speak to us this day, that you would encourage us and strengthen us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we see in chapter 11 that Nehemiah revisits the need to repopulate the city. If you remember from chapter 7, they took a census. They listed all the people. They counted all the people who lived in Judah because Jerusalem had now has been rebuilt, uh, but there's nobody living in it. So basically it, was, it wasn't nobody. It was a few people living in it. So it's just a, a, like building a building and having nobody live in it. It's like having a home, but nobody being there. Uh, um, so they're, they're, they're now going to actually repopulate the city. They've took the census, and it says... It says, first of all, it says in chapter 11, verse 1, Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem. They led the way, as leaders always should. They should lead the way. They were the ones living now in Jerusalem itself. But it says this, it says, And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten... Uh, remained in the other towns. So you can imagine this. You got, you got tens of thousands of people. And they're all, they all agreed to say, we're going to, some volunteered to say, we're going to cast lots. We hear about that casting of lots in scripture, but when you hear the idea of casting, it means like, it means like, like kind of you can take it as throwing the dice or pulling out of the pot, uh, drawing sticks. But when the word cast, it has the idea of finality to it. Like, this is what it's going to be. This is the decision it's going to be. So they cast what's called lots. And lots in the Hebrew literally means it's the idea of having pebbles, sticks, or pottery shards thrown or blindly pulled out of a container for decision making uh, based on what seems like chance but was a communication of the Lord. So they said, the only way we can do this is, who's going to volunteer? They stick their hand in the pot, they pull out the names, and guess what? The decision's final. You're going to move. You're going to uproot your family, and you're going to go live within Jerusalem itself. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, we look at maybe taking today, we said the idea of casting lots is kind of... Oh, that's kind of like satanic or something like that. We don't want to do like casting lots. is like playing in the lottery. You shouldn't play the lottery, not because, uh, 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 well, because you're financially sinning. Why are you throwing your money away, really, to be honest? Uh, um, unless God personally gives you numbers, then you call me, and I'll verify it. And <laughs> then we'll be partners in it, okay? We'll, we'll draw our names together, but that doesn't happen. But you think about, imagine living in a time where you just had to, you had to just always, there was always in the Old Testament, they're casting lots, they're casting lots. Aren't you so glad that we live on this side of Scripture, this side of the cross, that we have the Holy Spirit who guides us and directs us? 
right? He guides us and He directs us all the time. And, uh, and, and, and there's times in, in life where we can say, I could do X, Y, or Z. I have three different choices or two different choices. I don't know what to do. Just pick one. It's going to be okay because they're all equally good. You can make your decision as to what you think is right, but ultimately, as Proverbs 16.33 says, what? The law is cast into the lap, but what? The decision is made. The Lord does it, right? So we even have the certainty that God is always going to guide us and direct us. But it was because people volunteered. People volunteered to go live in the city. It's an amazing thing. In chapter, in chapter 11, verses 3 to 12, 26, it lists all the leaders and the priests who live in Jerusalem. And it was, uh, was populated again. And now that the city is populated because people volunteered, they're going to take their life, they're going to uproot it, and they're going to move to a city. Can you imagine living in the country and then moving to the city or an urban area? I have no idea what that is like at all. Some of you got that. Some of you got that, right? Because that's what happened to me. I moved from the country down here uh, to there. But they did it. And I thank God for people who volunteer in church. If it wasn't for people volunteering, what would get done here? What would happen? I can't do it all. Elders can't do it all. Deacons can't do it. Sunday school. If you didn't have Sunday school teachers, we wouldn't have Sunday school. We wouldn't have preschool. We wouldn't have this. By the way, we still need help in preschool. So please think about volunteering for that. But it's people willing to give of themselves who make things happen. They were willing to volunteer. And now the work of God was going to move forward. And as the work of God moved forward, it's now a Jerusalem now becomes again an official city because it has people living in it. And they dedicate the walls yet again. They dedicate the work of God. uh, uh, um, And look, listen to what it says. In chapter 12, starting in verse 27, it says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the walls. They brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs to give thanks. Look at how they praise God. With singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. If anyone tells you that God doesn't like loud music, I think you're wrong. Right? They, in the Old Testament, they, they, they rock the house, man. They really, they really praise God. They really... They, we, you know, we have great worship here, man. And maybe we should be a little bit louder. And I don't know. But... That, all right, you're up. <laughs> Is that you, Diane? <laughs> right? But you want to always do it in order. Even when they praised God, David appointed an order. There was order in it. We can go off and just and rock, the, and, and you can actually lose the, the, the sense of the spirit in it. Um, but they went up. Now, they dedicated the wall. The city's repopulated. Things are now happening. They're at the tail end of everything that, they, uh, that Nehemiah set out to do. And this is years in the making, by the way. This is in like 52 days they built the wall, and then boom, this happens. This is year, We're talking now, we're about, we're about 13, 14 years into this thing, right, uh, according According to the timeline, and they begin, they dedicate, and they had two great choirs. Says, and I brought up the leaders of Judah onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. And our text would tell us, if you read, says that Nehemiah brought the leaders up onto the wall because you could actually walk around the walls of Jerusalem. I always had the privilege of doing it uh, way back when, uh, um, and you can still walk to this day on Nehemiah's wall. It's still parts of it are still standing to this day. Uh, um, so they got up on on, on the wall, two great choirs. One went north, one went south. And the way the text reads, it's hard to figure out if as they walk, they spread themselves out and surrounded the city or they walked together and met at the other side. But can you imagine spreading out four and a half miles? They spread out, right? And all they did was give thanks and praise to God in loud voices. They rejoiced gratefully, uh, greatly, right? And the result of people volunteering was great rejoicing. It says uh, in verse in chapter 12, verse 43, it says, And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. Has God ever made you rejoice with great joy for what he's done? 
where you've just seen God's hand come in a situation. How often we just equate that when my life is bad, when things are desperate, and God comes in and rescues me out of it. I rejoice with great joy. Do you rejoice with great joy when things are good? When You know what? I know what it's like to just sit there and hang on the edge financially and God come and rescue us time and time and time and time again. And you know what? I praise God for His rescuing, but it gets tiring, it gets old, it gets wearing on you. What we need to do is learn and rejoice greatly when God doesn't have to come in and rescue. We learn to rejoice in the good times and be thankful for that. But God calls them to rejoice with great joy, says the women and the children also rejoice. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. They were rejoicing. I mean, they They were rejoicing and shouting and singing God's praises. Far away it was heard. Far away it was heard. Does does, does the world see the Lord's joy on you and I? I mean, do we have to walk around shouting out and singing, you know, like making a spectacle of ourselves? No. But when we come into the presence of unbelievers, do they know, do they hear, do they see that the joy of the Lord is our strength? Do they see something different about us? Do they see something different about us? Is it heard just by the way we carry ourselves? Second result of people volunteering and the work of God going forward was that they responded to the... Well, actually, uh, let me... I got ahead of myself here. In, verses, in chapter 12, verses 44 to 47, now it lists all the service that was done in the temple and the provisions that were given. So the wall is dedicated, and now they get back to, to, to the temple, and they're dedicating the temple, and they're bringing in the tithes and the offerings into the temple, and temple worship is going forward, and it says, this in verse 44 of chapter 12 it says judah meaning the nation rejoiced over the priest and the levites who ministered think about that they rejoiced over the priest and the levites who ministered are you rejoicing to be able to come here now i could easily go into you should be happy that i'm standing here maybe you're not maybe you are i don't know i know i'm happy to be standing here and pretty much to me that's what matters right now uh but think about it They rejoiced over who God put over them. They're even rejoicing because now there's a return. They were 70 years. There was no sacrifices. There was nobody teaching the law. Nothing was going on. And God brought back that whole system, taught clearly the word to them, brought them back. And they rejoiced because they knew what God required them. They knew now, now they were in right standing with God once again. And they rejoiced over the, the, the Levites and the ministers. And I would even take that a little further. Do you rejoice? Over the leaders here at Bible Baptist Church, do you ever go up to your kid's Sunday school teacher and say, you know what, thank you for teaching? You know your kids. You might want to thank them for teaching your kid, right? You know what I'm saying, right? You want to be glad. You want to be thankful. Just the small words of encouragement to somebody. To your Sunday school teacher for teaching adults, the men's ministry, women's lives, just thank you. Just say thanks. It goes a long way, trust me. Trust me. And I can't tell you how many times people have said thanks to me. And I needed it at that moment. I needed something like that from God. So just think about that. Second thing they did is they responded to the word of God. It says this. It says, and on that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned that curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now, it's interesting to see that once again in Nehemiah, we see the emphasis upon the Word of God. Now, we read in chapter 8, they explained the Word of God. They took all day. They clearly explained the meaning of it, right? They were exegetical in it. But yet then here, we see again that the law is read again. A portion of the law, the law of Moses is read. And, you know, how many times did the people of Jerusalem hear this? This is what God says. This is what God says. Or how many times have you and I read the same text? We just read it, read it, read it. And then there's that one moment where I got it. 
I understand exactly what it means. That's kind of what happened here. Whoa, God said to do this. So they separated themselves from things that were declared unpure by God. We'll talk about that again in a little bit. So things are back on track. There's great rejoicing. The temple is in order. Things are happening. And of course, what happens? The villains pop up. Right? As soon as you start going in God's direction, things happen in the way. The villains pop up. Because what had actually happened up to this point is Nehemiah was not even in town. Nehemiah was not in Jerusalem. It says, um, it says, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked to leave of the king. I asked leave of the king. So we're talking Nehemiah, according to historical records. It's historically verifiable who King Artaxerxes is. It's historically verifiable that he, Nehemiah went back in 433 B.C. There's historical records proving this. God's word is provable 100%. But Nehemiah was gone for about a period of 12 years. And in that 12 years, things went south real fast. Things went bad. So listen to what it says in chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. It says, Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of God, he was also the high priest, and who was related to Tobiah. Remember that guy, Tobiah? His arch enemy from chapters 1 and, and on, right? He was uh, against Nehemiah. He wanted to kill Nehemiah. He wanted to work to stop all this. It says he was a relative of Nehemiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and, wine and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions to the priest. Can you imagine this? This guy, Tobiah, now actually had his residence within the temple courts itself. Within the temple courts. Matter of fact, this guy, Eliashib, took out the provisions, the tithes and offerings. That was the room where everything was stored. The provisions for the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers. Their pay, so to speak, was kept in that room. He took it out. He threw it out. And he moved this guy, Tobiah, right into God's house. That's how bad things got. The Levite temp Levites and temple workers were forced to leave. It says in chapter 13, verse 10, it says, I also found out that the, the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his own field. So the provisions for the Levites, the temple workers, that's why the tithes and offerings were given. That's why grain offerings, so all these things were given. They were to be used to feed the Levites and the temple workers. That was their pay. And they said, we're not getting it. They weren't being paid. So what did they do? They head out of town. What would you do if your boss came to you and says, you know, I'm just not going to pay you for the next, you know? Would you show up? No. If you tell me I'm not paying you no more, Pastor Eric. Get your committee together. You're going to get a, you're looking for a new pastor. i got to feed my family, right? And it's okay for that. To happen. But this is what's happened. They said they weren't getting paid. They, they were literally starving to death. Says they went each to their own field. Why? I have to plant crops. i got to feed my family. And that was contrary to what God said should happen in his word. You're to take care of them and provide for them so that ministering before me does not stop. Because And they ministered in the temple 24 hours. They didn't stop. They were taking care of the lamps. They were singing praises. They were doing this. They were doing 24 hours a day. Ministry was going on. And it was now stopped. Because of this guy, Eliashib. It says also in verses uh, 15 to 22 that the Sabbath was neglected. Marriage laws were not kept in, in 23 to 29. Matter of fact, they so intermarried and so disobeyed the marriage laws that God said that their children were no longer speaking Hebrew. That's how bad things got. Read it for yourself. They were no longer speaking Hebrew. Things had gotten really bad. Nehemiah comes back after some time I asked leave of the king he goes back to Jerusalem he finds all this stuff in disorder Nehemiah responds with very swift action it says in chapter 13 verse 8 he says he threw out Tobias furniture and brought back what belonged to God 
He went in there. He must have just flipped a gasket, right? I mean, just, what is this? I mean, just went, took the furniture. I could just see it in my mind, taking it, throwing it out, get, you know, just going berserk about it. He calls the priest in, the Levites, says, purify this room, make it right. He put in what belonged to God back into God's house, what belonged to the Levites, the, 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 the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple workers. All that went back. He went out, and he confronted the leaders about this. He says, so I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Chapter 13, verse 11. The people in charge of the city. Why is the God house God's forsaken? If you remember back to chapter 10, verse 39. They made a covenant, right? We swear we're going to do these things. What were the last words of the covenant? We will not forsake the house of our God. How quickly they forsook the house of the Lord. And things went bad real fast. Nehemiah brought back the temple workers as I gathered them together and set them at their stations. He reinstituted the Sabbath laws. He says in chapter 13, verses 17, it says, Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing? profaning the Sabbath day. Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath? I mean, Nehemiah goes back, he says, what is this you're doing? Weren't we just in captivity for 70 years because of what our fathers did? And now you're going to do this? It's going to be worse for our children. How could you be doing this? He was just like beyond himself. It didn't even make sense. He reinstituted the marriage laws. Verse 25 of chapter 13 says, And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to our sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Nehemiah was getting things back on track. But the great thing about Nehemiah, the great thing about good leaders, is they're willing to back up what they say. He wasn't just saying, This is what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to put action behind it. Listen to what he said about the Sabbath laws, what happens. Verses uh, 20 and 21 of chapter 13. It says, Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Nehemiah said to these guys, so here, they're getting ready for the Sabbath. He peeks over the wall. There's all the people getting ready to come in and start selling their stuff on the Sabbath. He says, if you do it again, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to open up a can of whoop on you like you've never had before. That's literally what he's saying. I'm going to go down there. I am going to physically harm you if you do this. They backed away. So what else he did? Concerning marriage laws. Chapter 13, verse 25. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. He was serious about this. He, cur he didn't curse Adam, but he brought God's curse upon him. He recounted to them what God says about what you're doing. He grabbed some, he pulled out their beards, and he beat them. Man, Nehemiah's hardcore. He's my kind of guy. I like this. <laughs> He says, there's this one guy, uh, verse 20, it says, And one of the sons of Jedediah, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, the same guy with Tobiah, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Hornite. Oh, that's Tobiah's buddy. That's Tobiah's cohort, right? Therefore, I chased him from me. He says, there was one guy, I went after him, but he got away. Like he was, oh, he got away from me. Nehemiah was willing to back things up. He was a man of action. God's word doesn't tell us if he was right or wrong in his reaction in, in, in this, but it does show that he was vindicated. He was full of the zeal of the Lord. They had so profaned God's house, he had to send a message. You know what? As leaders here, there's a new policy going to be instituted here at Bible Baptist Church. Okay? No, it's not. <laughs> I'm going to say this, though. There might be times where that happens. There was a young man in, in Calvary. Uh, his name was Ben. And I was running a youth group. I was there for a few years. And um, he was just, he was a nice kid, but he was one of those kids that was always just, he's a real smart aleck. He was, just, was, was a bright kid, which didn't help things, right? Made him more dangerous. And we were outside one day, youth group, and uh, he was just, just trying to push my buttons. And he was just, you know, kind of not taking the Lord serious. 
And I walked over to him and I went, bam! I punched him in the chest as hard as I, I crumpled the kid. I just crumpled him. And I said, I leaned over and I said, Ben, when are you going to stop playing games with God? I led that man to the Lord right there. There's times that that might be needed. <laughs> Can some of us say, you know what? If it wasn't for God kicking my rear, I wouldn't be here. I have seen people, it literally took, sadly, a physical beating to come to the Lord. Shouldn't not let that things happen, man. We shouldn't get to a point where God says it has to come to that. God's word says, blessed is the one who falls upon this rock, who willingly breaks themselves as to the pose of the one who this rock falls upon. But you need to be willing as leaders. We're going to back up. We're going to deal with things. So often churches, problems rise up in church and they just kind of, you know, ah, that, ain't, that, ain't, that ain't nothing. Or how often in marriages, husbands and wives just push issues to the side. They put them in another room. They put them away, put them away. You know what the problem with that is? Pretty soon the room that you're putting those issues with can't hold any more issues. And you're going to go and try to put one more issue in there. And it's like the cartoons. You open a door, boom, it just all comes out at you. You. And bad things happen. The same thing in churches. You just put things under. You just put things under. And you don't deal with them. You can be sure of this. We'll deal with things at Bible Baptist Church. We'll deal with it in a loving way according to God's word. And if it ever comes to it, we'll ask you to leave. Because you're polluting the body of Christ. You're not being, we're not keeping the purity of the church. We want to deal with things in the right way. And I just pray it never comes to where i got to curse you and pull out your hair. Um, <laughs> No, I'm teasing. But what a man of God. What confidence Nehemiah had to act in such a way. He was confident of who he believed. He was confident of what God called him to. He knew way back when, when he heard report from his brother Hanani, that the city of Jerusalem was in great shame. And he knew God called me to a great thing. To establish this city once again, the holy city, as the scripture says, the holy. It's where God chose to live. And he's, and he's how dare you profane God's house? How pro dare you profane God's people and God's city? He was serious about it. It's a lesson for us to be zealous in chasing after the Lord. Are we concerned about how God is perceived by outsiders by the way we live, by the way we act? We see, though, that Nehemiah was vindicated in this. Four times in chapter 13, Nehemiah uses the word remember. He says in verse 14, it says, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. It says in verse 22, it says, remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. God, I've done right, man. I think, God, don't mix me in amongst these people. Don't let me fall with them. Lord, remember me. Then he says in verse 29 of 13, he says, remember them, O God. Because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priests and the Levites. God, take care of them, God. In the last verse, he says, in verse 13, 31, he says, Remember me, O oh my God, for my good. When you do what God has called you to do, when you do it in the right spirit and the right heart, you can be sure of this. God will vindicate you. David says, Oh Lord, vindicate me. Before my enemies, Lord, let me triumph, right? Let me be above all this, Lord. Let them see who reigns. Let them see what is really going on. You know, there might be times in this life where people come against us, and we may never see justice here on this side of the earth. May never see it. But you can be sure of this. At the great day of judgment, God will make sure that you're vindicated. You and I are vindicated in whatever. He's going to make all things right. That's going to happen. That's why Jesus said, God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know what? As much as I might like to, mm, in my own flesh, the fact is, God does a much better job than I ever could. Right? That's just the truth. God does a better job than us. But what was the overall result of happened, 
of what happened with Nehemiah's reforms and his willingness to back it up. See, if he didn't have teeth behind it, if he wasn't willing to back it up, nothing would have happened. I'm going to give you a little parenting tip. If you threaten your kids with something, even if it's ridiculous, and they go against you, what you do? Do what you said you're going to do, unless it's, I'm going to kill you. You shouldn't even say that to your kids. But back it up. Do it. If people don't see that, if people see that you are not a truthful person, you're not willing to back up your words, they run all over you. It's going to happen. Nehemiah was willing to back it up. And the result was purity of the church, purity of God's people, the purity of his house, the purity of his city. See, that's what's always the goal. It says, thus I cleanse from them everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. See, Nehemiah cared about things as marriage laws. Don't intermarry. Don't have anybody foreign. And there's been a period in, in, in church history, and there's still some pockets of it, which would tell you today that you can't marry a person of a different color. That's not what God is saying. God said to part the people of Israel as a different people, a peculiar people. They were to be separated unto themselves. He said, don't marry foreign people because they worship foreign gods. And if you go to them, guess what? You're going to worship their gods. If you read in Nehemiah, the rest in 13, what did ne Nehemiah say to him? He says, hey, did not Solomon fall because of this very thing? He brings back the memory of Solomon. He failed. To be pure in marriage. And he worshipped foreign gods. And God brought his kingdom down through his son, right? Marriage laws in the Bible are a view of purity. Of being pure and separate. Same as those with uh, 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 the uh, Sabbath laws. It's not to make a bunch of rules, say so you can't this, you can't that, blah, 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 whatever else. Because we could take things to an extreme that God never meant them to be at. God says it's a picture of purity. You have a day that's separate for me, that you give just to me. It's an idea of purity. The lessons we can learn out of Nehemiah here are that we need to be diligent in the purity of his church. The purity of our own lives. Our purity of following his word and what he says. God cares about purity. Are we striving to do what God has called us to do? I believe God has called us to great things. I am absolutely convinced God's called us to great things. I'm convinced God has caused us, called us to grow as a church physically. Grow us strong spiritually so that we could send people out of our church to go plant churches. I have no desire to have a big church. None at all. I'm not a mega church kind of guy. It's not, it's not in me. That's not what I want. Well, I want to see people... In other communities that desperately need a church that preaches God's word in its fullness. To have a place where they can go and worship locally. That I believe God has called us to do it. But in the midst of doing that and trying to do all those things, guess what? We're going to have to deal with issues. And all those issues always come back to purity. Are we pure in our doctrine? Are we pure in the way we handle people and all these things? Nehemiah was zealous for the house of God. How much more should we be in what God has given to us? Think about all that God has given to us. We have his spirit. We have his full word. We have everything at our disposal. God holds us on this side of the cross, I believe, far more accountable for what we have because we've been given so much more. So much more has been given to us. And as long as we are diligent in pursuing the purity of God's word, the purity of his church, there's no limits, no limits as to what God's going to do through us and for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you again, Lord. It's, it's life-giving. It's refreshing. Lord, I thank you for the reality of your word, Lord, as we read about Nehemiah. Just being zealous for you, Lord, in, in ways that we can relate to. Father, I pray that you would help us to be zealous for our relationship with you. That we would have zeal with knowledge, not without knowledge. Lord, that we would be people who hunger and thirst for you, who long for your courts as we sang today, Lord. As we long and we wait for you to work and move in amazing ways 
through us. Lord, help us to always be diligent and zealous for the purity of your church here in Hasbrook Heights. Father, continue to be with us. Watch over us as we leave this place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship.